Oh, <laughs> hey everybody. Welcome to the channel and the stream uh, with Marvel here. This is Nelson Blake II. And today we're gonna be doing a lesson on how to draw the Hulk. But we can't talk about how to draw the Hulk without talking about how to draw overall. So, when I, so first we're gonna do a bust and then we're gonna do a full body shot. So the thing that I think about a lot before I go into anything, even if it's as simple as a bust, is design, right? So the first thing we're gonna do in terms of design is we're gonna talk about location, where we're gonna be putting this picture, right? So when thinking about design, for me, it's always useful to actually get away from the canvas. Don't work too big. And just think about the abstract areas that the drawing is gonna fill. So in this case, we kind of have a predetermined view that the drawing will fill this area. And that's going to be what we're looking at. So before we even draw, we can see how just the general idea of the drawing is going to fill the space here. It's going to fill the void and divide the picture into an asymmetrical space that creates a certain amount of balance between the Hulk and the space around him. So there are certain things I like about this design already, but I am going to refine it a little bit in order to... In, in order to create a space that's, that just has a few more things that I like. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna push his head out. Now keep in mind, this is not a drawing yet. This is still just a design discussion between me and the canvas, right? I haven't thought about anatomy or you know, facial expression, not literally. I've thought about those things maybe in, you know, in, in my head as a general idea, but right now we're just gonna create some, some divided space energy. So I'm a little more satisfied with this than with that first blob of a shape. And at this point, I'm ready to go in and actually start working. So for the sake of you guys, I will reduce the opacity there and leave this general shape. Normally, I would erase that shape. There's really no need um, yet to, to do that here. So you see here we have a low opacity. And the beautiful thing about that is this is so simple that it's not even drawing yet. So it's very stress-free and your imagination has room to roam. Once you start putting in structure, then, the, then every little piece that you put in the drawing is a piece brought out from your imagination into the real world. So the transfer of energy of information goes from your imagination into the actual drawing. And that's where we're gonna start right now. So before I get into really drawing it, there will be some lines here that look a little structural, but really I'm thinking about energy and design still at this point, right? So you can see here, these are not lines in any way meant to represent real anatomical human structure. I'm just kind of putting where the information is going to go. We're just talking about simple arrangement of blacks, open space, and information spaces. So I, I arrange things in terms of lines, which I call either information or gray because of how it looks when... Um, when you reduce the piece and when you when you step back from the piece when a piece is published so I think of everything as either black white and gray or black white and detail or black white information that's that's generally how I think so as you see here when I'm kind of scribbling along and sketching even though there's some little bit of anatomy going into it I'm not thinking in terms of structure I'm thinking of motion I'm thinking of where the lines are going where the information is going so you can see here these heavy blacks in the lower area by his chest are indicating that there's gonna be some shadows there, but it's not, the purpose of those right now isn't so much a shadow as it is when we get away from the picture, we can see here that the information kind of creates its own pattern, its own, it'll eventually create a light source once the objects are fleshed out, but the point of it really is design, is thinking of where we're placing the general masses. You see here with the hair, no structure. Now, I'll talk a little bit about the Hulk himself here, I'm privy to the um, Dale Keown, Lanil Francis Yu hairstyle of the Hulk, where he kind of has like a, it's not even a mohawk, he's got that kind of shaved head kind of thing going on. I just like the shape, I don't really have a reason for it. Um, that's, just, that's just my personal preference in terms of the hair goes. Uh, I, like, I like the look of the Smart Hulk, the Banner Hulk, but I like what, you know, that that became part of Angry Hulk later on in, the, in uh, comic book lore, because originally Hulk had more of that Frankenstein look, which I don't mind, but I, I like the new stuff as well. And I'll admit fully that a lot of that is influenced from like the Marvel versus Capcom games and stuff like that, which I was always a huge fan of growing up. So now at this point, we've got the general design here. 
And before I go into structure, I'm just gonna throw some lines down to see how I feel about you know, where the lines are going. So when people are putting down their details, they're, a lot of times they're thinking of the what of what they're drawing. What is this? What should it look like? What I've learned in comics is that much more important than the what is the how, you know? How you represent these muscles with the lines that you throw down. How you represent these um, details with the way your design is influencing those details. Because you can choose whatever line. Like I can draw a million lines here and put a lot more information on his chest. And even doing that, I do kind of like that there. I, I kind of like that, you know, that pulling over here and keeping really what you're looking at, if I was to draw it on the side there, you're seeing that kind of pattern in his chest. And you're just using the muscles to express that pattern and keep this energy radiating up towards his head, right? So like his, his trapezius, you know, his back muscles uh, that we're seeing here in the traps is pointing towards his head. His head has this little focus in the anger of the facial expression. And then his muscles, whenever I'm able, will kind of form this energy going so that we have this little momentum in our shapes here before we get to the actual drawing. Once those things are done, drawing becomes very easy. If you already, obviously, if you know your anatomy, if you know your stuff, because now that you know where things are supposed to be going and what they're supposed to be doing, the randomness is taken out of what you've done and, you, and you've added this design element. So now we're gonna move on and start actually drawing, drawing like properly, all right? So there was a question on Twitter a few weeks ago by uh, Chris Aaron, actually. And he's, he's a cool guy, follow him. He asked, what part of the face do you do first? And for me, the part of the face that I do first is the brow. Let me just check my tool here. Okay. The part of the face that I do first is, it will, the brow is kind of an oversimplification. Um, it's this structure that combines the brow and the eye sockets at the same time. So I always like to think of the face in respect to the skull. I always want to have a knowledge of the skull grounding every part of the face that I'm drawing. I don't ever want to draw floating features on the face. That's a lot of, that's a problem that most young artists struggle with because they're just trying to keep the features in the face and kind of good looking. But if you have a knowledge and awareness of the skull, then your features will be locked onto something solid that even though we might not think about it as artists, as humans, we're very easy to pick up on when something isn't, you know, on a version of the skull. No matter how cartoony your work is, um, if you guys follow me on Twitter or Instagram, obvious plug, you'll see that I draw a lot of cartoon cartoon stuff, right? Like everything's not comic, everything's not realistic. I'm definitely um, one of those artists that really enjoys drawing in different styles. But these general ideas still apply. The ideas of design are universal and the ideas of um, bone structure are universal. A lot of times when people ask about anatomy, they only think about the muscles. But the bones hold the muscles together. The bones tell the muscles where to go. So, you know, so even here when drawing his teeth, I'm not gonna draw floating, you know, teeth. I'm thinking generally of the skull. Now, I'm not gonna draw the entire skull. And in fact, I'm drawing a little bit more of this stuff than I normally would to show you guys as I'm discussing this. But the more you draw, the more you get an idea of where these things go. And you kind of know where it goes so you don't have to draw it all the way through. Obviously, when you're learning, it can be helpful to draw all the way through, for sure, but it's not necessary once you are aware of where stuff is. It, it can become a waste of time to, you know, draw the entire anatomy before you, before you work, because you're going to get the same result, right? But, and that's why I talk about awareness of the skull. So this initial brow structure, which can really fit facial, any facial expression, right? Because it's just the brow line and the eye sockets. And that can be whatever facial expression you want it to be. It can kind of be flexible because this line is not indicative of the skull or the muscles. It's thinking about both of them, you know, the same way the human body kind of works. And ideally, as you develop your structure, your structure becomes efficient for you, right? Because you can pick up any anatomy book and learn all of the ins and outs of anatomy. But when, you, when you're on a deadline and you actually have to draw stuff, you can't draw that for every if a figure i mean if a page has 30 figures on it 
there's no way you're drawing 30 skeletons and then 30 full anatomies and then putting clothes over all of that work that you just did to hide it that the viewer never sees it. That would drive you absolutely crazy and it'll drive your editors crazy. So as you develop structure, hopefully you develop a structure that lends to the efficiency of keeping your drawing solid and having everything make sense, but at the same time um, allowing you to move quickly. Through, and as your knowledge increases, less and less structure is necessary to hold your drawings together. So, you know, anatomy is a separate practice. Always compare it to like learning your free throws in basketball or learning your scales in music. Like, yeah, you have to know it, but you don't, you don't want to think in those terms. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's just something you're supposed to be able to do as a pro. Uh, you're supposed to understand that and have that, have those fundamentals as a part of your, your game as it were. All right, so there is an, a muscle anatomy thing I want to talk about right here. So on most characters, this area right here, this clavicle, is a bone, right? If you look at normal humans, that's a bone. But if you look at bodybuilders or extremely muscular people, this, this uh, pectoral muscle develops very big on top of the bone. So it takes on a different shape than the kind of uh, bow, wishbone slash bow and arrow shape that it takes on normally. Uh, when you have a clavicle on a skinny person, on a, you know, a human who's either slim or, or women have very prominent bone structure. Their structure is more defined by the bone than the muscle uh, because of the differentiation of their pelvic bones and stuff like that. But on the Hulk, he's a very different character. And part of the reason I wanted to draw him, because I've been doing so much cartoony stuff recently, I wanted to draw somebody who was more reliant on muscle than... Uh, than, than bone for his character, visual character description. So that is pretty much that, and let's see where we are. So normally I do a lot of erasing um, when I'm working. I really love erasing as something I picked up from Mark Silvestri, where uh, and, and Michael Broussard working uh, in their studio on the West Coast. And what I love about erasing is you constantly are redesigning things, right? So say if I, I can erase all that stuff I drew and then kind of decide where this is going to go design-wise. So now, again, I've returned from the structural thinking back to the designy thinking with, these, with erasing what's there. When you draw on top of what's there, you kind of have to deal with what's there. But when you erase it entirely, you're kind of refining your ideas. Uh, there's something I'm actually going to suggest to you guys. If you follow Travis uh, Charis or Travis Charest, I'm not sure exactly how it's pronounced, on YouTube and you look at his time-lapse videos, you see this constant erasing of information and then replacing of it. And this always brings you back. It demands that the lines that you put down are design lines. They're not just, uh, I pull too much. They're not just uh, floating lines and they're not nonsensical lines. They're lines that both satisfy your structural criteria and they also satisfy your um, your design criteria, which is actually, I mean, it's more important than your structural criteria because design is the language of the abstract. It's the emotional language that we all relate to when we look at a picture. And it took me a long time to learn that. I was focused on drawing for all of my teens and all of my 20s, to be honest with you. I didn't start focusing on the uh, design aspect of this until my 30s. And, and honestly, my later 30s, I, I didn't even like really just dis discover it until then. And I found that my understanding of art, my fun in art, went way up once I started really looking at things in terms of design. Because it's the, I don't even want to call it the secret element, it's really the main ingredient in, in all art. But in comic book art, it's really important because design is connected very closely with your storytelling. So even if we look at this here, before I go any further into the drawing, we'll see that before we even know that this is the Hulk, look at the tension of these lines. Look at the way the lines kind of point and, and kind of, you know, angle and strut around his figure. That's a design decision. That's not me saying this is how a forehead literally looks. This is how, you know, cheekbones are literally represented. Uh, that's the beauty of comics is... It, it, it is very much an abstract language in addition to cool looking drawings. So keeping your brain focused on design is really the, 
I would say it's a secret weapon because most people, when they first get into art and f first like really get into comic book art, they're very, very focused on drawing. And that's a necessary component. Like I said, it's free throws. Nobody wants their NBA player missing all their free throws. It's a free shot, right? Um, same thing for guitar. Like nobody wants a guitar player who doesn't know his musical scales, scales uh, or a dancer with, good, or with bad timing. But while that stuff is important, it's not the thing that really gets people vibing with your art. What really gets people vibing is the expression of your design in your work. So I'm just gonna pull the side of his face in a little bit here to give him a little more of a head turn. And we are pretty much good to go to start drawing, drawing this guy. So here's a little trick. Uh, this is a drawing trick. Always, always flip your drawings to just make sure nothing's super crazy. And that was a really good move, pulling his head in. And there's one thing that I want to do here. I just want to shrink this area and bring this, bring this up here a little more. Really, there we go. Get that Hulk exaggerated trap situation going on. I like that much better than uh, seeing his neck too much. And from here, we are pretty much good to go in terms of, uh, we're gonna start like finishing this drawing up. So I'm gonna do one pass of this with, the, with a little bit of erasing, and then I'm gonna do, and then I'm gonna ink it. And inking, I mean, this is the thing that makes, I mean, I just call it inking. This whole thing is an ink because I'm working digitally. But the thing for me with inking is really just enhancing the design. Uh, that's my personal approach to inking my work. I don't care so much about the individual um, literal expression of a line. So whether a rendering line is done like this, or it's done like that, or it's done like that, these are all valid ways to render the same idea. What's important is that it's not too thick, it's not too thin, uh, it's in the right place, it's going in the right direction. That's the kind of stuff that really affects the design. So whether you use a squiggle or a hatch or a cross hatch or you know, your thumbprints, as we see a lot of, a lot of guys doing now, um, that's all valid, that's all totally fine. But what really makes it work is the um, It, what, really, what really makes it work is the directions of, I mean not the directions, but the placement and the thickness of where those lines are rather than exactly what you're doing with those lines. So someone asked for tips on line art. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that real quick. Well, that's exactly the part that we're about to get to. So we've covered design and we've covered basic anatomy, right? Like we only have the general upper body here. Uh, I talked about his traps. You've got these, these neck muscles which go up behind the ear and uh, everything else is just basic facial anatomy. I would say for that, you just really wanna you know, study the skull. And so now, we're gonna get into the line art. And, the, and really, the line art is basically, there's two parts to line art. There's your personal athleticism, which is really, if you do this kind of thing all the time, your hand will get smoother, right? And you'll be able to do smooth lines on the page whenever you want. So that's the key, is you want your Whatever kind of line you want to do, not that every line has to be smooth, but whatever line you want to do, you want to be able to perform it. Whether it's a rough textured line or whether it's a, um, you know, a super smooth slick line, which is what I more lean towards, you want to make sure you're able to do it, your, your hand is able to do what your brain has. And that really just comes from you doing it over and over again. Literally just drawing lines over and over again before you do your drawing session will get your hand to start to obey you. Um, after that, once you have that done, it's really your design knowledge that will determine whether or not people like your lines. Um, going back to what I was saying, people like this kind of hatching, that kind of squiggle, thumb prints, heavy inks, thin inks. Every style is completely valid. Every style has its fan base, but what separates the you know the ones that people really like versus the ones that um that are not so successful is really their sense of design coming through in that line work so here i'm just going to finalize my structure on a few things so what i like to do is i like to go in with this little soft brush and just lighten the details because i'm not really trying to change anything i'm really happy with all of this uh 
structurally, I'm really happy with this from a design standpoint. So I'm not trying to change the info. I want my inking to go on top of this. But what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take a few of these areas that aren't literal and specific, and we're going to um, make it more specific so that when I'm inking, I can ink with a lot of confidence. And we're gonna simplify some of these facial ideas and, and drawing decisions. Uh, someone asked, what's the hardest face to draw? That is, that, that depends on you and how much you train, to be honest with you. The real answer to that is the easiest stuff to draw is the stuff you draw the most, and the hardest stuff to draw is the stuff you draw the least, All right? So the, mo the more confidence you build around certain things, it'll get to the point where nothing is really easier or harder than anything else. There might be things that take more time, um, but easy and hard doesn't necessarily come into it because, I mean, really the reason most comic book artists draw faces very quickly is because they've drawn so many of them. And the same thing will be true, should be true for yourself if you're trying to become a pro, is if you draw so many, there's no such thing for you as uh, easy or hard. There's just, well, this is how you do this and this is how you do that. You know, it's a, it's a what and a how, not necessarily an if. It's not a question mark, it's a, it's a statement, you know? So hopefully that answered that question. But if you want any face to be less difficult to draw, reinvest your time into learning how to draw the skull and and how to build and, and then individually learn each facial feature and learn it at all angles you know and also don't be afraid to use your reference so i didn't do it here but normally what i would do if i was having an issue with the face if i couldn't if i just couldn't see the structure which sometimes happens sometimes your brain just utterly betrays you and for some reason you are several percentage points less of an artist that you normally are. And when that happens, you want to have a, a fallback of reference to make, you know, to make sure you're, you're solid and make sure everything's working properly. So for me, um, the, I mean, with faces, the easiest thing to do is just take a picture of your own face. You know, make that facial expression, do some acting, get yourself emotionally invested in that facial expression, you know, pull up a mirror and, and uh, really try to make that come home in terms of the feeling of the piece and the storytelling of the piece and actually making the facial expression is great. Also just on a creative level, you know, it, it, you're gonna feel differently about a face that you've actually made and you'll see a lot of artists do this when they're drawing stuff, especially animators. They'll be making the faces they're drawing because they're emotionally invested in that feeling. And I'll make another musical comparison, the same way a bass player in say funk guitar plays with his whole body uh, a, an artist will, will draw with more of their body. They'll draw with a little more of their face involved because they're, they're trying to communicate this thing and just simply imagining it and drawing it with their hand isn't the, you know, isn't quite enough for what they're trying to get across. They want, they need a little more oomph, like, like making guitar faces and stuff like that. The face doesn't help you play guitar, but guitar faces <laughs> help you play the blues. Um, as some people might say, right? So same thing with these facial expressions. Even when you make that facial expression and you take the reference, you, you never wanna fall into the trap of actually drawing your own face. I mean, I shouldn't say never. Some people have a lot of success doing that. But if it's not supposed to look anything like you, you don't wanna draw your own face, right? Uh, you wanna definitely have the character look like the character. I don't want the Hulk looking like, you know, a. a black comic book artist from, <laughs> from Queens. I want the Hulk to look like a gamma radiated monster rampaging, right? So in that sense, um, you know, you don't want your reference to disable you. You only want to take the information that you want from your reference, from your, your posing, from your model, right? Like you don't want a lot of people's troubles with photographs is that the photographs stiffen the, their work up. And the way to avoid that is to have a, a good sense of structure before you, not before you use reference, but in addition to whatever reference you're using. But even without that element added to it, um, just posing for your reference invests you in what you're drawing. So now we're gonna get straight to the inking. I'm gonna check the time real quick. Okay, we're making pretty good time here. 
and I feel like I've explained a decent amount of this. So we're gonna get into the inking. So what I'll do in comic book work a lot is I'll do the outside of the inks first to get a sense of um, where I want the line weights to be. And I like to go really low opacity on that under drawing. That's just a personal preference. Though. So I'm generally of the school of outside lines thicker and inside lines thinner. I like the design of that, but I also really, really love a thin outside line. That's not what I'm going to be doing with the Hulk. Again, I like to draw a lot of different styles, so I tend to see things less as a right or wrong and more as a what do you prefer to do. And in the case of the Hulk, because he's got all of these little thin like interior muscle lines kind of and facial lines and anger action lines all over the drawing making the design pop, I want the thicker outside silhouette to hold that together a little bit. And the thick, smooth lines on the outside also allow me to accent it with his hair, which adds to the storytelling. I'm gonna show you in a second. Try to get this right here. There we go. Okay. So we see here, the thing about a silhouette, silhouettes are very important, and I definitely should talk about silhouettes right now. So when we go to the silhouette here, there's a certain rhythm of this right here, right? That's a rhythm. If you see there, it's kind of like smooth, 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 and then the hair is gonna be tearing this up, the eyebrow is gonna be tearing this up, it's smooth, smooth, smooth. And so we recognize that these are anatomical lines. We recognize that this is a skull line, and then when this hair silhouette comes in, not only does it tell you that this is hair, but if you're familiar with the design of the Hulk, it also will tell you that this is the Hulk, which is very useful for me um, as, as a storyteller because silhouette is one of the easiest ways to read really anything when it comes to any kind of art. If you look at something like Indiana Jones, uh, they'll have these you know character silhouette moments and Steven Spielberg, amongst other directors, big fans of introducing characters with silhouettes because it's a very strong element of the visual language. So as a comic book artist, you definitely want to use that to your advantage as well, to use that visual language element. So we've got our whole silhouette drawn already, and now we just ink the interior and we're good to go. Okay, so someone asked, is, so just, just Gaming asked, is drawing digital easier than drawing with a pen? Honestly, it depends all on what you draw with the most. I don't think that Either is easier than another. If you take a guy who's been inking, you know, um, all of his life, and you take a take a girl who's been doing digital all of her life, they're both going to be much more comfortable with the tools that they're used to. What what I'll say is for me, the the thing that digital inking or digital drawing provides me is the ability to ink my own work. So when when you're penciling, as you guys can see here, this is all one phase of drawing for me. So even though I'm inking, I'm doing cleanup. Um, it's still one phase of drawing. Whereas when you're working in pencil, usually there tends to be two phases if you're gonna ink it. And that's a completely 100% total finished uh, pencil drawing and a completely 100% total finished ink drawing. And for me, this and this is a personal thing, so this is not like art advice or anything, but I had inkers who were really struggling to ink me because I worked very clean. And when you work very clean, every mistake an inker makes becomes very obvious to the uh, viewer. And here's another thing that's easier about digital inks is uh, filling in blacks. That's definitely a good look. Although there's there's ways these days that you can combine inking and you know inking with a digital pen or or a natural media pen. So don't think of the two as necessarily like totally separate either. There's a lot of hybrid methods and styles out there where digital is just part of the equation or inking is just part of the equation. A lot of stuff going on with that uh, all over the place. But that having been said, for me it was a way for me to ink myself without um, having to double my time working on a page. And I, I could just, and it's been honestly, I started, ink, I started working digitally in about 2011 and it's been a study in all of that time for me of like, how much, how much information do I want to do in the drawing? How comfortable do I need with the drawing? Because quite honestly, say if I was on a deadline, I could have started inking on top of that. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I didn't need to fully flesh out, flesh that out. Once I got the design down and the general structure of the anatomy down, you just kind of get the eyes and nose down, and you can freestyle the rest of the way and have a pretty good idea of, of what you're working with there. So, yeah, so... I, again, it, a lot of art is more about what you're comfortable with, what you draw the most, what you like the most, what you're most enthusiastic about, less so than is something actually more difficult, right? Like if you talk about stuff that's actually more difficult, say like, you know, drawing a whole bunch of buildings with a whole bunch of windows is always going to be more work than drawing one building in the background or, you know, people are in a snowstorm, right? People are in the desert um, where there's just smooth sand dunes and your colorist is going to come, come in there and make it look a little bit more like sand. Of course that's easier than if you have to render a whole bunch of buildings because there's less uh, of it to do. But generally, it's more about your comfort and how much you have personally worked on that individual skill set than it is about uh, how, you know, whether or not it's actually easier or harder. So here is where we're gonna, so I'm combining these kind of organic lines of the flesh and these action lines to bring that anger across. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's what's going on there. And this is what I was telling you guys about with the line work, where this is all just, uh, I'm actually being a little more haphazard than normal because I wanna bring a little bit of that Hulk energy. I don't want it to be too smooth in the finish, I want a little bit of, uh, you know, roughness and aggression in the lines. So I don't mind these lines kind of overlapping each other a little bit. I don't mind a little bit of extra. Now here, I'm going to delete those because one of those lines was just too thick. Uh, the thing about thickness and thinness of lines is that they create a different pattern when you zoom away from it, right? So if you've got, let's say hypothetically, I'll do an exaggerated one. So you've got a thick line right here. Look at how that thick line announces itself on the interior of that structure. Now, it's not that that's a bad thing. It's that I'm going to use that on purpose. I'm not going to do that by accident, right? And so when I use those thick lines, I'm using it around structure areas, right? So like his upper lip, which is naturally going to have a shadow on it, that's going to have a thicker line. His nose, which is both bone and creating a shadow, that's going to have a thicker line on it. Uh, a, a bolder line that announces itself in the center of the drawing. But I don't want these little flesh and anger lines, which are just kind of accents, to demand too much real estate uh, on the page. Those lines are just, just assistance. You know, they're just accents. They're not the main course, as it were. Just here with the gums. So the gums are interesting because uh, whether you drew whether you do gums black and white or in color is actually kind of a big deal in your drawing. <laughs> Not something most people think about, but I like the gums in, I mean, it doesn't matter. It, de it really depends on the piece, but because there's no heavy shadows in the rest of the piece, I want the black areas to be very, very specific. So I've already assigned that the interior of his mouth is gonna have some black area. The, uh, the eyebrows are gonna be black. The hair is gonna have black. The bottom of the chest, and which is also the bottom of the picture, is going to have black, and there's going to be black nowhere else in, in the rest of the image. So as this image develops, it's going to be like, you know, black here, black there, black there, and you get kind of a one, two, three going on. And there'll be a little bit of black under the chin as well. So it'll keep the contrast in this part of the picture, and then kind of a bookend over here, and a bookend down here of black area. Uh, creating kind of an overall pattern in terms of blacks of like this right here. Right, so that's kind of the black pattern of the picture. And so for that reason, I'm not putting blacks like all over the place here, uh, which, which was another option. And in the full body picture, we'll use more blacks to show a different approach to that. This one's going to be a little more open, a little more used for color, a little more, you know, action marble as opposed to moody, um, high contrast stuff. And again, I, I love working in different styles, so it's very uh, useful for me to switch around and have different approaches. That just keeps me entertained. Uh, and part of it is I like a lot of art, you know? Uh, so I don't, 
for me, I've never been the kind of person who just always wanted to draw one way. I'm much more excited by the many, many different ways and all of the artists that I'm influenced by being able to, you know, play in all of their playgrounds. So here's another example of what I'm talking about. Uh, I could be really careful and render these lines very closely, but I just want to keep this kind of energy going on here. And I'm actually going to go thicker there to keep it. So you see here these thick lines at the bottom? Yeah, this is anatomy. Cool, cool, cool. But the real issue is I'm trying to keep that division of black and white really strong and really solid and really dictate where the thick lines go. So even though these lines might look really thick when I first laid them down, in the context of the picture, uh, they should work because we already did that in our sketch because we focus so much on the overall design of these lines as opposed to, you know, these are just trying to get the anatomy right and stuff like that. So here this shoulder line is pretty thick because I want to make sure that anatomically we honor that separation of shoulder and, uh, and chest muscle there. And now we are just about ready to wrap this up. Zoom in for the uh, jaw and the teeth, and we're about ready to move on to color. And I will take a moment to check you guys' questions. Uh, I think we pretty much covered everything in terms of this phase of the drawing. So if you guys have any questions for this phase of the drawing, uh, in terms of drawing heads, in terms of what I discussed in terms of it, like design and so on and so forth, Feel free to ask that stuff now, but once I get to the full body drawing, I will be focusing on explaining that part of the process, and the same thing with the color. I'll be looking to explain the color part of the process as well. Although we're not gonna be doing like some crazy painted hulk here, we're just gonna color them green and keep it moving. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna check for these messages real quick. Do I use any stabilization? I don't think I have stabilization on here. Um, I don't think I, I went 100% without it for a while and then I put it on and then I took it off again. I'm actually not sure. I know I got my settings to a point where I was comfortable, but I have worked with both. And to me, stabilization uh, re relies much more on what the tool is than what the, um, than what the actual, than, than my hand, you know what I mean? Um, my hand is able to create the lines that I want because of training, but the tools in the program are going to have various levels of the way they perform. And sometimes a stabilization or a lack thereof might enhance the way that tool feels. And that's how I personally use stabilization. Uh, because I, I don't like for the program to take too much control from me. But that all depends on your style too. You know, Some people's stabilization might be a big help. For others, it might actually really hurt what they're going for. But I'm not sure how much I have on these tools that I'm using right now, to be 100% honest with you. I know that on my turnip pen and my rapidiograph pen that I use for tech, I have a lot of stabilization on those because I want those lines to be as straight as possible. You know, I want that stuff to be as mechanical looking as possible. So the, the effect that the computer has on it is very positive in terms of uh, storytelling because it takes the human element out of it because it's not something that I want to look like it was made by human hands. I want it to look like it was made by a machine. So, you know, having that look like that, it, even on the line, on the level of line, is a great assistance to me when it comes to drawing mechanical stuff. All right, I think we are a few teeth away from being able to send Hulk to colors. I also wanted to add it's a little bit of that Hulk. Uh, you know what? I'll add that in the final layer. So I was going to add a little spittle in the mouth, but I'm probably going to add that in white so that it pops a little bit more. So I'm not going to do it in the ink phase because uh, what that would do is that would multiply it and I'd have to recolor it. And I like to paint, quote unquote, paint my whites in rather than recolor it. Okay, so there we go. That is our inked Hulk. Uh, that is the full image of Inked Hulk there, All right? He's ready to go to colors. And oh, he is not ready to go to colors. I did not finish his neck and do his uh, chin shadow. It's 
So we're going to do that real quick. And it really does help at a certain point to get rid of that bottom layer and uh, reconsider the inks as a standalone piece of art without the influence of what's under there. If you guys have ever worked in pencil um, and had a piece of artwork that looked really good when some pencil lines were there, but once you got rid of those pencil lines, it didn't look as good, it's because those pencil lines were part of the art. And when you got rid of them, they were no longer part of the art. And so here I'm in the phase where I'm inking, I'm using the inks as their own piece of art without 100% without the influence of the pencils. And there's certain things now that I see the piece, certain decisions that I'm gonna refine here, like just a little more line weight on this ear, which I really shouldn't be doing on a live stream because it doesn't matter that much. But you know, I think it matters for you guys um, if you're still looking for information on the inking process and what kind of decisions get made. That's what kind of decisions get made for me. I wanted to pop that ear out a little bit because of structure. And I also wanna add some tension around the bottom of his mouth uh, in this kind of fleshy area to just add a little action, a little tension, indicate that there's some uh, you know, structure going on here. And I'll also you know, bring some of that down to the bottom of the face. And, and you know what? I don't like this line because it doesn't indicate the kind of jaw I want for Hulk. I want his jaw to pop out a little bit. A little bit more muscle on his face. Uh, that jaw was a little narrow for me, and now I'm a little happier with it. All right, so now we are going to go to the coloring phase of this. So first thing with colors is um, if we go back here to our original design, there are essentially a, a good buddy of mine, Scott Iwahashi. Um, he's on Instagram. I definitely recommend following him. He's taught me so much about art. So um, one thing he said is there's basically only two ways figures work on a background. It's either light over dark, or dark over light, right? So when we did this design right here, we decided on light over dark. So essentially, the Hulk is gonna be colored darker than the background. So that's the first thing I'm thinking about is this original design, it did already influence the color because we want that feel of a darker Hulk on a lighter background. So this is a daytime Hulk. Now we could have very easily reversed this. Let's see if we can do it here. Okay, so let me see if I go 100% here. And this is the reverse. This would be a darker background with a lighter Hulk, right? So this would be Hulk in medium to light green tones with like a light source. Maybe you get a uh, some whites going on in on the inside here for the lighting if we were doing that. Right, just some basic light sources and his teeth would also probably be pretty white. And that would be the light over dark design. That is not what we went with. We went with, we went with a dark over light background. So now that we've gone with a dark over light background, um, the first thing I'm gonna do is, well first we'll multiply this layer so we can draw through everything. Just in case I put any whites, I like to multiply my line art layer. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to think of a base color to base everything around, right? And usually this is just, just generally a complementary color to the, to the main tone, but the emotion of your piece is going to dictate what that main color is. And so for me, this is going to be um, this orange in the background, right? And so first I'm going to play with this orange and get it to a place where I like it. So right now this orange is a little pale for me. I want to saturate it a little more. There we go. I like that orange much more. Now, this orange is pretty um, dark for, um, for us doing a darker Hulk on top of it. I would have to make this a very dark Hulk to really contrast against this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna lighten it up by adding the influence of some yellow and just a soft gradient here. And I keep my gradients really simple uh, with pieces like this. Just a soft gradient to indicate a light source. Nothing super crazy. Uh, no special effects here that we're going for. And that's it, and we're pretty much done. And now I'm confident that if I put a green on top of that, 
the green doesn't have to be overly dark to work. And so we're gonna just look for a green color that works on top of it. And it's really just a green that I like. So I like that one much more, all right? So now that we have our green color, go in, select, change my select tool around. So this is refer edited layer only to select. That means I'm just looking at the line art and selecting the outside of the line art. Then I'm gonna reverse that and fill in, my, I'm gonna create a new layer and fill in the color there. Bam. So already I can make some coloring decisions based off of this. I'm gonna leave that selection there so that if I color inside of the Hulk, I don't color, I'm, I'm carrying this outside of the lines. I don't color outside of the lines if I'm coloring the Hulk, right? That'll keep my selection tight. And this is a faster piece, so, you know, we want to we wanna be able to get through this kind of quickly. We're not going to go flat the whole thing. So I pretty much like this. The only thing I don't like about this is I want to cool this green off a little bit. So we're just going to keep looking for greens uh, of this type until I, I cool it off to the point that I want. Now, there's two ways to cool off your green. One is to move it a little towards blue, and another is to just desaturate and move it towards gray. Um, I, I, I actually did a mix of both, and I'm a little happier with this green as his mid-tone. And so now we're just gonna find the shadow green to throw into his shadows. I like that a lot, actually. So we're just gonna go ahead and drop some shadows here around the muscles and the key areas. So this is Oh my god, I forgot the name of it. But there's a form of shading where it's just basically shading in the crevices of the piece, you know? You're just shading in the areas where things kind of cancel the light as they are near each other. So just as forms round off a little bit, that's where all of your shading is taking place. And that's the kind of shading we're doing here. Now another shading is when you shade the entire shape of something, right? So you're basically saying Hulk overall is a rectangle or a brick, and we're going to take an entire side of that brick and shade it in. So to give you an example of what that would look like, um, here's what that would look like, right? So this whole front side of Hulk would be in shadow, and it'd be much more dramatic lighting, right? Like so, everything here would be in shadow, which is, again, another cool way to color. There's no right or wrong, it's just preference. And then maybe on the outside here, we would have a rim light to add the dramatic lighting to that. But that's not the approach I'm taking with this Hulk. I'm going for a more medium color kind of thing. Again, more of a open comic book kind of splashy sort of thing rather than a high contrast thing because we're going to go a little high contrast on the other piece. Let me check your questions again real quick. How did I start art? I actually started art at a very, very young age. I was drawing from cartoons when I was a kid. I was actually turning cartoons um, into, into comic books when I was a kid, because I didn't know that comics existed yet. I was like maybe, maybe five years old. So I was just drawing the cartoons and then writing the words next to their mouths. And then a couple of years later, I got my first comic book and I was pretty much done forever. Uh, so how does the shading affect the look of the anatomy? That's a good question to, to address right here. And that's really what we're doing. So one thing I could do here is I could take th what I'm doing so far and add a airbrushy kind of tool. Make sure I have the right one. Yeah. So I could take an airbrushy tool or a texture tool and, and, and yeah, let's use this texture tool and kind of soften up the muscles there. And you know what? I'm actually going to do that for the sake of this. So you can see here, I added some very simple shadows. And I'm just going to transition out of those shadows with a softer texture brush. It's just going to add to the roundness of those shadows. I'm going to make this brush nice and big so that the texture is nice and big. And in, in painting, they call this uh, edge control. So anywhere where there's a soft round area, you can use soft round shading. Anywhere where there is a very hard structural area, you want to use more harsh structural shading, right? So that is how we are approaching this one. And really, this is just an effort to make the anatomy a little rounder um, and also add a little texture to his skin, right? That's another thing you want to think about is textures. So in the preview image for this Hulk that I did, I did a very slick, smooth one. But here we're going to add a little more texture, you know, and, and we're using the brush 
to bring that texture in. We're actually almost done with that. I'm gonna go back to my regular brush, back to his neck shadows here. Whoa. Sometimes I forget how big my brush is and I press really hard on it to get a larger uh, brush effect, but that was not necessary in that situation. We're not gonna go too hard on these little necklines. We're just gonna indicate a little bit that they have some shadows in there. I don't want them to become an entire story all their own. Really just wanna enhance what's going on here. See, I put a thicker line here, so I'm gonna put a little bit more on there, and I'll emphasize, emphasize his trapezius a little bit right here. We're good to go, and now we will add the shadows to his face. I'm all on the same layer here. Normally, I would have an entire separate layer for flats if I was doing a finished piece, but this is a little bit more of a sketch, so we're gonna, you know, treat it like a sketch as it were. So right now, I'm using the same level of shadow everywhere, but I will go back into the shadows one more level and give you one darker level of shadows to just add a higher level of contrast. And I'm only gonna put those shadows probably on his face and I will give an overall like shadow gradient to his uh to his what do you call it to his entire body but I'm not going to actually make the uh I'm not going to draw that in because I don't want the bottom of the picture getting too detailed and this again this all goes back to the design right when we designed this piece we didn't have a crazy distracting detailed bottom of the picture we had a simple you know, using blacks to kind of frame it a little bit and then moving on, and that was how we treated that. So I'm gonna leave his teeth, his tongue, and his gums and his eyes for a completely different layer. We're just gonna work on the green Hulk layer right now. And there's two things I wanna, well, actually first, let's go ahead and fix his hair situation. So here, I'm just gonna draw the hair in, uh, which is, a nice little speed tactic and I'm just checking the uh, saturation of that a little bit I want the hair darker and green but I don't want it to have as much color expression as the body because again the hair is kind of simulating the black there right like if you guys remember in that in one of those early sketches I um I made the hair completely black so now the color is going to push that idea not that his hair is black but that his hair is this kind of crown, this framing element that's darker than everything else, right? Everything else, you know, below it until you get to the bottom of the picture. So we still have this element of framing the face and the body with the hair and the shadows around the pecs. All right, so that is pretty much that. And I'm gonna save the highlights for another time. So we're gonna do one last thing here and I'm gonna add a gradient layer and see how I like it to see if we can just add a little bit more of a transition from um, dark to light with the entire body of the Hulk. Okay, that's a little too dark. I mean, a little too light. Oh yeah, that's way too light. Let's try that again. Okay, that's a little too saturated. And that's better. All right. So that's just a little bit of that. And bring in a little more gray. Yeah, desaturate a little bit. And now I'm just gonna airbrush a little bit of blue into this, just a little bit to, uh, to add a little coolness to the bottom of the picture, which is something that a lot of colorists I really love do this. They just put a little bit of blue, just kind of hinting at the bottom to indicate, you know, um, a cooler ambient light source going on where you desaturate it and add a little more dimension to it. So, you know, a little more layers to the picture. All right, and so we're gonna wrap this up soon and move on to the full body shot. But let's go ahead and color his eyes and his teeth. And then we are going to color his, uh... then we're gonna add, pop in some highlights and we are actually done from that point. So the eyes, we're gonna go with the slight yellow on the eyes. I'm just gonna draw it in, I'm not flatting this. Actually, I could, I could, if I wanted to, select the eyes, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to draw that in there, keep it simple. And we're done with that. And then with the teeth, we're going to do the same thing. 
Now, I'm going to take this, so a lot of people will do the teeth straight white. I don't like white unless I want something to really be white, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that green and I'm going to push it to a very lighter, neutral place. So this is not white. This is like, this, this includes some of the green of the Hulk. And what this does is it keeps it in the family of color uh, on his body instead of just kind of like completely alien foreign thing because when you when you color anything light is bouncing all over the place right and so one of the things you want to do with colors is you don't want to have a color if you're talking about something that's naturally lit if you're talking about something really expressive then you can do whatever you want but if there's some semblance of natural lighting in the picture that you're doing then you want to have the basics of you know there are other light sources in here bouncing off of each other right like light works very similarly to water and water bounces it's like think of light as being sprayed from a hose and light bounces all over the place right and so when you are coloring you want to bounce that light all over the place as well so you want to think okay a little of the orange of the sky might be in the color over here a little of the green of the skin might be in the teeth over there and you know you play around with that you study photographs you get a good vocabulary for how that stuff works and then same thing as we said before you, f you you incorporate that into your design style right so you're not literally lighting something as it would be lit in real life you're using that as a design and as a storytelling element to make your work to give your work more flavor more color more dimension um, to create more of a world as opposed to you know shirt is red pants are blue this doesn't look like it's actually inside of an environment you want to stay away from that Alrighty, so let's see, we've got the tongue here. So now I'm actually gonna use my select tool to grab the tongue. I think that's gonna work. Same thing with the tongue. I want it to be, you know, roughly the color of gums, but I don't want it to be too saturated. Whoa, let's try that again. Uh, what select tool do I have here? There we go. Right, so, and the thing about this purple with the Hulk is it's, comp so it's a little bit purple, and I like that, uh, because it's complementary to the green in the Hulk, and it also is kind of a call out to the Purple Pants Hulk, right? Like, I'm the kind of person where any opportunity I get to throw a little bit of purple and green in the background of a Hulk comic, I would, like, throw little things in there to let you know that the Hulk is coming, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and it's a little cheesy, but it... I'm, I'm cheesy, so that's on, that's on brand. And we're going to get the inside of his mouth here. So for the inside of the mouth, I'm going to go darker, even less color. There we go. All right, and now we're just going to apply some basic shadows to this. A little bit of shadow I don't want to get too detailed because again I don't want this to be an area of distraction I don't want this to be an area of uh, you know attention getting in the piece this is just literally it's only to add dimension to what's going on so that the teeth aren't too flat on the hook wonder what was going on. I had, a, I had a bad selection there. And I couldn't see where it was. All right. And, and so we're just going to add a little bit to the teeth. Nothing too crazy. Uh, as the teeth recede into the background, he's going to let them go into his mouth. I'm not going to overly do it with the contrast here because, again, I just kind of want them to be elements on their own. And yeah, pretty happy with that. The only thing is I'm going to add a little more shadow to the tongue as well. Just so it's not flat. 
All right, so there are only two things left to do, and that one is to add highlights, which is very simple, straightforward. So I'm just gonna take that green color on the Hulk there, find a lighter version of it. Good enough for me. Hit certain high corners on the piece not get too into it these are just internal highlights this isn't coming from a very specific light source this is just me emphasizing the structure of the Hulk and then we're going to uh, select the select from this layer again so I, I bounce my select tool from select edited layer to select from all layers and this gives me quick easy selections as I'm going through a piece like this so the first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna create a highlights layer and we're going to just add a little bit of rim lighting to the Hulk for just a little extra drama. And we're going to choose a light source, a, a color for that light source. So we have this orange. I'm going to attempt a blue here. But it's not going to be like true blue. It's going to be more of a, you know. Okay, so that, that pretty much works. We'll desaturate that a little bit, a little lighter. Alrighty, so we're gonna wrap this up. I'm getting called for time here, but I think we got through a lot of good work here. Um, you see here, we got the uh, we got all our highlights in, we got our gradients in, we got our explanations in, and we are about to move on to the uh, to the full body drawing. We'll see if we can get that done. All right, so I'm saving that to clear this, clear all of this. Save this as a new uh, file name real quick. All right, and now we are going to start the new picture, the full body picture. So the same rules apply as before, right? I'm thinking of this in terms of an overall design. So there was a question earlier about line of action and we will address that in this drawing right here. So with these kinds of designs, I don't need to fill up like the whole page. I can, uh, you know, I, I can start with a little small design though. I see I have a selection there. Yeah, there we go. All right, so this is, this is just an action shot of the Hulk uh, kind of leaping forward. And so we have his center mass here, and I really just want his limbs to add stability to the shape and anchor it. And the key thing here is what separates the Hulk from Spider-Man when he's doing the leaping pose is that huge upper body, right? It's that massive upper body, those big arms, and that should be represented in the silhouette. Big fists, you know? And so even here, before we have the piece drawn, we've got a pretty good sense that this is a large figure coming at us. Just silhouette, right? So I'm gonna go over this lightly with the erase tool. And now we can talk about action line a little bit now that this is, has been erased. Up. So this is important. We wanna think about the momentum of his trunk. So there's a little bit of a body swing here, like he pushed his head forward, right? And as he pushed his head forward, his, his uh, torso swings off to the side here, right? So we've got slight forward movement with the head coming at us like so. And then we've got a slight, you know, twisting of the pelvic motion against it. So in terms of, so this is a foreshortened pose. So we're not getting you know, the same kind of line of action that we would get on a ballerina pose, but we still get some of that action going on in this momentum. So even here, I'm not drawing anatomically yet. I'm not thinking of where the muscles go and what the structure is. I really am just thinking of the motion of, you know, the Hulk coming at us with this really big frame. So this is influencing, you know, the size of his fists and you know, the size of his head and all of that stuff going on. We're really just looking at bringing that sense of power to it. So somebody asked, could you ever draw a Hulk that's too muscular or not muscular enough? That's all style. So, and I'm actually glad you asked that question 
Um, because the thing about Hulk for me is there's two ways to think about the Hulk. One is to think about the Hulk in a exaggeration of Bruce Banner, where he's Bruce Banner, but he gets big and green. And another is to think of the Hulk more like a werewolf, right? Where the, the Hulk is its own creature and he transforms into it. Now again, because of my influence of like video games and stuff, I prefer something that's completely impossible for uh, Bruce Banner to change into and go from there. You know what I mean? Uh, that's, that's what entertains me personally about the Hulk, that he's just way too tall and the, the pants is just one of those things where you're like, listen, we could not draw the pants and never have a Hulk comic, but if you want a Hulk comic, then his pants magically <laughs> stretch around the parts that uh, we want to protect everybody's children from until they're old enough to be weird enough to want to see the Hulk without pants. So, <laughs> but other than that, the Hulk for me is not a literal trans, uh, trans you know, transformation in the sense of uh, Bruce Banner is, his bones are growing and blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, that's technically happening. But spiritually, philosophically, what's really happening is that he's turning into the Hulk, the same way a person kind of turns into a werewolf of any size with no logic required. So from here, we pretty much have a really good sense of it. We don't have to do quite as much designing as we did um, with the other piece, because I really just did that to illustrate to you guys what I'm thinking of, but I am still gonna design in terms of light source here. So you'll notice I'm thinking a little bit of anatomy, and I'm thinking much more in terms of design. Right? So I'm thinking of the way these blacks anchor into his torso and that kind of disappears into the background. I'm thinking of the way these muscles get described right, with a little bit of detail. I'm going to let this part go. Thinking of the way his pants are going to wrinkle, the way his leg muscles are going to bulge out into his knee, which is going to be foreshortened. So that's, this is going to be a tube coming forward. And I'm literally just walking you through the uh, process of this as we, as we get through it and what I'm thinking about, you know, uh, when I do these lines, because it's not always super straightforward as that, right? So some of this is design, some of this is detail, but the real key is I'm thinking of how this is all going to feel. I'm not trying to be correct. If there's a phase in this process where you correct your structure and you, you know, you make things work properly and so on and so forth, but the, the point where you're expressing things is not that point. That's what, that's what makes your work too stiff, um, you know, too, too structure oriented. And listen, if you study structure enough, your structure is going to be fine. But the balance of keeping structure and keeping your expression, that's a lifelong exercise. So that's what I'm trying to help you guys out with here is to get a sense of how to, how to you know, balance being structured and being expressive and you know, keeping the energy and the design of your picture intact. And that's, that's really what it's about, is about energy and design. So I'm gonna turn Hulk's head just slightly to the right here, and it's for two reasons. One, it works against, it works with the pelvic swing, um, and it puts a little more motion and action on his head. And two, it keeps, the, it keeps us away from complete symmetry. Because while symmetry can be an effective tool when you're working, um, at the same time, it can also very, very much flatten out your work. And you want to use symmetry when it's appropriate. You don't want symmetry sneaking up on you because you thought, well, logically, he's looking at the camera. It's, it's totally okay to turn them slightly off kilter. I could have turned his head the other way and had his eyes looking forward, but I don't want to draw pupils on the Hulk. And for, for the sake of this drawing, I just like his head turned in this direction for the, for the momentum that we kind of created with this swinging motion. So now, as I'm completing this kind of silhouette, we talked about that before with silhouette, I'm really just making sure that his muscles bulge in the right areas. You know, his fist has like the hardness where it's supposed to. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's, uh, we're pretty much ready to go in and start drawing, drawing, you know what I mean? And uh, being, being anatomical with this thing. So there we go. So that is our, well, you know what? Let's complete the design. Let's uh, get the hair in there. So here, I'm not using the hair as an entire black space because 
unlike the head drawing, um, I don't need the hair as, as powerful of a framing device because his torso is so big, right? So now I'm just thinking of the gaping hole of his mouth and the action lines of the brow and all of that stuff. And we'll throw him a little cast shadow here for the head so that it's clear that it's pushing forward. And now we have a decent design representation of the Hulk. So what I'm gonna go from here, I'm just gonna reduce that a little bit. And in fact, let's uh, select the other layer, reduce both of them in case I need that other layer for some reason. All right, there we go. Give us a little negative space. So now we're gonna move in, and here we're gonna start working anatomically right away both because that's the point at which that I would do this on the piece and because we have, I think about 30 minutes left. <laughs> so we am gonna try and get this on time for you guys. So we have our silhouette kind of set here. So what I'm gonna be doing is just, again, really thinking more anatomically here, but using those anatomical shapes to create the power of the Hulk. So the big difference between a Hulk and a normal muscular superhero, for me, is I want all of the muscles of the Hulk expressed. Whereas with a normal figure, you're really thinking about, you know, having this be somewhat of a believable human in some respects. So having muscles all over the place might take away if that person, like, has a secret identity and is supposed to be a mailman or something, right? Uh, I mean, that's a terrible secret identity. I apologize, but... You know what I'm saying, right? Like, if, if this character is supposed to ever be believable as a human, they kind of have to believably fit clothes a little normally and stuff like that, right? But with the Hulk, he's a completely transformed thing, his own beast, and all that matters is he's just this hulking, literally um, just monster of, of muscle and athleticism. And that's another thing I love about the Hulk, is that the Hulk is an athlete. I always think of the Hulk as being super fast in addition to super strong, not because speed is a power of his, but because, you know, any true athlete gets more explosive when they become more athletic as part of athleticism. I don't think the Hulk is just athletically strong. I think of those muscles also working in the other ways, which is the basis of his power jump, right? The reason he's able to jump from like city to city is because his legs are so powerful. Well, if you watch any sport, people who can jump that high also tend to be pretty fast. And to me, that makes the Hulk scary because it, it's kind of like a crocodile. You know, I don't know which one is fast, crocodile or an alligator. Like, you see those things run, it's like, oh, wow, you run faster than I do. That's not fair. And that literal feeling is one of the things I absolutely love about the Hulk, that uh, that's not fair, that you're that fast because you're also, when you catch me, I'm not going to win. So I would at least like some advantage. And the Hulk is like, no advantages on the Hulk. Why, that's why I'm here, and you're all secondary characters when it comes to strength. When it comes to raw strength, especially in the Marvel Universe, pretty much everybody I've ever known that and, and grown up with, you think Hulk first. And uh, I like that fear factor, being in Hulk's athleticism, this idea that you think you're fast, but he can chase you down and, and kind of get you. So, you know, with the Hulk, those muscles have to be fully expressed for me to feel like he's a uh, believable Hulk. And so all of the little things, um, all of the little things, like those, like the bulging muscles over the collarbone, making sure that the chest overlaps the abdomen and the rib cage, right? Um, making sure that you get an overlap there of those muscles. That stuff um, really matters with the Hulk because it shows that he's overly muscular. Like literally, this is not, He's not possible. Yeah, and that's the, that's the thing for me with the Hulk. I don't want the Hulk to be possible. I want the Hulk to be impossible. I want him to be, you know, he, he should be the thing that you ask Banner, hey, you turn into a guy who's super strong. Why are you so afraid? And he goes, you haven't seen the Hulk. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you wouldn't like me when I turn into the Hulk, basically. You, don't, you wouldn't like me when I'm angry. So for that reason, um, the Hulk has his own muscular expression that I think you're really free to exaggerate to your heart's content. My only thing is that he does look mobile. I don't want the Hulk to look like a statue of muscle at any point. I want the Hulk to always look like he's on the verge of sprinting into you and, and doing Hulk things. I actually, I know a lot of people uh, have opinions about the uh, first 
the, the Hulk movie with, um, I think it was the Ed Norton one. But one of my favorite parts was when he kicked, um, I forgot his name, his name is escaping me as I'm doing a podcast, but the guy who's going to turn into the abomination. And he kicked him into like a lamppost or something. That happened so fast. In the modern MCU, you could liken it to how quickly he snatched up Loki. Like that kind of explosiveness is what makes the Hulk, to me, kind of funny. Right? Like, he's not a comedy hero, and the point of the Hulk isn't funny. But sometimes, when someone deserves the wrath of the Hulk, it should be a little bit okay to laugh. Right? And I, I, like, I like that element of the Hulk that, you know, you think maybe he's on his way to calming down and becoming Banner again, and, and he snatches you up and slams you into the universe before you were even aware you were, you were, still, <laughs> you were still on the wrong side of the Hulk which is one of the last places you want to be in the Marvel Universe. But all right, so as I'm wrapping this up, I mean, guys, if you can't tell already, I can talk forever, but we have, uh, I, I tell you what, before I um, open this up for questions for the last segment of this, for the closeout segment, um, I will just discuss anatomy a little bit. Even though I am drawing the, um, a very muscular character, where in several instances his muscles overlap his bone structure, I am still thinking of the bones first and what goes on top of them. So I'm thinking of the way the shoulders pull apart, I mean the uh, clavicle pulls apart, the shoulders pull apart and stretch this muscle. That's where these lines are coming from, from the stretch that the Hulk is creating. I'm thinking of the rib cage with this bone right here, you know, this angle that gets created and so on and so forth. Um, so, so yeah, so even, even though it is more, he is a more muscular anatomical character, but kind of the most really. Um, I am thinking, the knees, I am thinking of the bones first. So, and that's the one key I would say with anatomy, is skeleton, skeleton, skeleton. Learn the skeleton first above all else, and then learn how the muscles attach to the skeleton as an entire mechanical unit. Don't individually learn muscles. Don't just learn the bicep. Yeah, I don't wanna say don't, but if you are studying muscles individually, complete that study by also incorporating, you know, here's how the bicep attaches to the shoulder. Here's how the chest, you know, the attaches to the sternum and the clavicle and how it overlaps the clavicle. Here's how the abdomen, the abdominal muscles fit into the rib cage. And if you do those things, uh, your anatomy is going to be functional anatomy so if you take if you you know if we're talking about anatomy and you take something from this uh, stream take functional anatomy anatomy that moves anatomy that breathes you know anatomy that overlaps and grows and gains fat on top of it that's one thing for me with the hulk is i do like the hulk to have a little a little bit of body fat i don't like the hulk to be so shredded that i feel like he has no body fat because i just like the look of a you know, a thicker based Hulk, a Hulk that's massive. And fat is not excessive fat until it's excessive, right? Everybody thinks fat is bad, but any um, person who does bodybuilding shows will tell you that when they're all shredded like that, that's not their healthiest. That's not their strongest. That's just when they look the most shredded. And so I tend to think of the Hulk in that way too. When I say fat, I mean, he's, still, he's got a very low, low body fat as it were. I'm just saying a little fat. Not, you know, not ripping the skin off the Hulk uh, visually. I like the Hulk that still has some skin going on. All right. So now we have effectively, hopefully, sketched. Let's make this deltoid a little more convincing. I was kind of BSing there. There we go. So the Hulk is completely sketched now. I'm going to flip him. Works for me. I can make that one, this leg a little bigger in the front and the knee. So we're going to do that real quick going to make this knee a little bigger. Okay, so someone asks, as a self-taught artist, he finds himself, he or she, finds themselves um, struggling to, it, to improve on, and you know it's all about practice. So the number one thing to always improve on to, to make your work better is design. Study design. Don't study I'm not, and when I say don't study drawing, I don't literally mean for you not to study drawing. What I'm saying is understand that drawing is a tool, 
but the design controls the expression of the art. The design is the, the master key. It's the thing that you're always working on all of your life. And the thing is, you can get 10 times better at design and deciding where you're putting things, and you don't have to get quote unquote better at what things you're putting, how many things you're putting, the, your level of information on those things. Obviously, you wanna work on that to your heart's content, but when it comes to information, you can always draw more information. But the thing that will make you better is getting better at design. Now, that having been said, um, color theory, if you're coloring, you can never know too much color theory. You can never have too many color schemes that you are comfortable with. You can always improve your lighting and stuff like that. So, and honestly, I would say find a professional and ask them, what can you really improve on your work? Because even though, it, so like I said, for myself, I'm self-taught as well, but I had a lot of mentorship from both contemporaries and from uh, pros who were older than me, right? So guys like Brian Stelfreeze, Mark Silvestri, who are older pros that were really helpful towards me. And um, some of my more contemporary people, uh, LaShawn Thomas, who's about four years older, three or four years older than me, uh, the animator uh, from the Boondocks, Scott Iwahashi, a good buddy of mine who graduated from Pasadena Art Center and uh, worked in comics for a little while. These people helped me a lot um, to, to close that information. Because the thing about art is what, lear what learning art is really about. And I'm gonna talk about this a lot more on my YouTube page. But what art is really about is changing the way your brain works, the way you see things, the way you perceive things, right? So when you say, I'm stuck, you're not stuck as an artist. Your, your mind is stuck as a person who perceives the world, right? You are not perceiving the world in the abstract language of art. That's what you're really struggling with. And, that's, and so the reason people think art is so difficult is because they're not studying that abstract language. They're studying the easier to understand literal languages of, um, you know, anatomy and perspective and how to draw a car and, you know, all of that stuff, how to, how to ink clean, all of this stuff is cool, you know, how to render in Photoshop, all of that stuff is really cool. But the abstract language of art is what makes you a better artist, right? Like those tools are all learnable. You can take a few weeks or a few months and learn any skill in art when it comes to drawing or rendering. But the thing that you cannot just train in a mechanical way is changing your brain to perceive art in a way that allows you to grow and learn that abstract language that's really behind the art, that, that really determines why some people will look, see artists talk about a person and go, man, that guy's work is awesome, her work is crazy. And you'll look at it and go, that looks kind of simple to me. It's because that person's probably a master designer. You know, That's what's really pushing that opinion because artists are speaking in that language and then what will happen is even though you know you may disagree what those artists are going to do and this is a you know i'm not tattletaling on anybody here but what those artists are going to do is they're going to rip that person off and use that influence that inspiration of that person's wonderful design sense and they're going to put that stuff in their own work that has more of those literal tools that you know the average person uh reacts knows that they're reacting to but the thing is, everyone's reacting to those abstract tools. That is a universal thing. It's just, the, it's just like music. The more abstract your foundation is, or should I say the more abstract your finish is, the more you're going to you know, alienate people who aren't used to speaking just the language of the abstract. But if you cover up your abstract in the literal, in the glitzy, in the glossy, in the sparkly finishes, you know, and the pretty hair and the, and the cool colors and stuff like that, it's gonna have much, much more of an effect than if you only did the glitzy, glossy, pretty hair, pretty color type stuff. So hopefully that answers your question. But if you have further questions about how to improve, feel my, my DMs are open, this is for everybody. Uh, I opened up my DMs recently, I didn't announce that. But if you have art that you wanna send me or art questions that you wanna send me, I cannot promise you a portfolio review because I am on deadlines, but 
If I have the time, I will give you a portfolio review. And if you have a question, I will either answer your question directly or I will dedicate an entire video to uh, answering that question in an in-depth way that can not only help you, but help everyone else. And so that's why with portfolio reviews, I'm not gonna focus too much on the uh, portfolio reviews, but you will get your question answered and you will get help for your work or at least as much help as I can provide um, in some form or fashion because I definitely want to put a greater focus on helping um, developing artists to figure some of these things out because I do think that a lot of art training focuses on the things that leave you kind of wondering okay I mean I learned that the hip bone connects to the backbone but my art still doesn't look great unless I'm drawing hip bones and backbones so you know, what do I need to improve? I do think we need to do a better job of uh, discussing art in those terms. Uh, somebody asked, have I had to draw different hulks? Have I had to differentiate and so on and so forth? Uh, technically, yes, I have, um, but it hasn't been a big deal. And differentiating the hulks, I think it's all about the language of whatever book you're working on. And this goes for any design. You and your editors need to design, need to decide from which of the vast universe of whatever company you're working for, obviously in this case we're talking about Marvel, um, what from the vast universe are you pulling from for the language of your book and then sticking to that language. I think that's the, that's the key thing there. And I'm going to look for another question shortly, but first we need to handle some uh, chest striations here. One of my favorites of all time, Drawing the Hulk, uh, I think mostly everybody's favorite, Dale Keown, a relative king of stress, of, of chest striations. Big fan of that guy. Um, and so here, I don't remember what I did for the blacks, and so I'm gonna pull up my sketch. Oh, that's what I did, cool. And so before, I went with more of a squiggly line kind of thing, but because this is, those lines are farther away and we're not on a head sketch, I'm going more for a slashy, you know, straight line kind of feel. If, um, if he was closer up, I might express those lines with a little more of this kind of language, but as it is here, I'm going to keep that to a minimum. And, and I'm a big fan of those uh, squiggly lines. I think Travis might have been the first person I personally saw using it, but there are a lot of European artists who uh, use those lines. And it's really, it's really just a hatch. I mean, it's just another form of hatching, but it's just expressed differently. And I am a huge fan of it. But because this is more aggressive, I'm staying away from cur curves just in general. Uh, this is not a piece that's gonna involve a lot of curvature. You can see here, even with the fingers, I'm going very angular, uh, hitting serious bone structure here you know, powerful Hulk knuckles and, and, you know, very expressive lines here. I will add a little bit in these crevices just to indicate shadows. And here in the shadows, I'll start to add a little more of the uh, squiggly lines, just to differentiate it. You don't want to have, want your lines to, again, this is a personal thing. Sometimes the same lines all over the place looks great. For me, I like to have a little bit of differentiation of line just for rhythmic sense, right? And even though we're running short on time, I just want to express this real quick. If all of your lines look like this, that's saying one thing, right? If all of your lines look like this, that's saying another thing. But the rhythm and contrast of these two things is a different rhythm. And I like that, I like having that tool to change rhythm because for me, lines are all about rhythm. And the rhythm here is very aggressive, um, very kind of strong because this is his bone muscle stretch area. That's really what I'm thinking here uh, with these kinds of lines is I'm thinking about how the Hulk is stretching, how when he stretches, you do see all those muscles. I, I'm a big fan of uh, sports. And if you look at MMA, you'll look at some people and they don't look like they're that muscular. But then when they throw a punch, you see every muscle in the anatomy book, right? When they dodge, you see every muscle flex for a second. 
And that's something that I've always wanted to stress and communicate in superhero books is to have that kind of, again, functional muscle, that variety. Now that's just a test, uh, a taste thing. That's not me telling anyone to do that. That's just me saying, I like that and I like to incorporate that. So as I'm doing this here uh, and I'm drawing these lines, that is what I'm thinking about as I draw these lines. All right, so we got the head done. Uh, the oh, body's almost done. Let's look at that on ink. Yeah, yeah, one more hand. So this hand is gonna be um, behind the knee here. The knee is forward. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the, ring, the uh, torn part of this knee thing and I'm gonna make sure that the overlap is clear. You don't ever want to almost overlap something. You wanna overlap very clearly. So that, it's, so that it's obvious, you know, that you're showing depth there. So I'm going to pull the fist a little bit behind here. And we're done. here. I apologize, I got quiet for a second. I just wanted to visualize this area uh, properly. And visualization is a huge key when it comes to drawing comics. You always, and that's what I was talking to you guys about before, is having that imagination active, you know, at all times. You never want to go on to, I shouldn't say never. You want to avoid autopilot when you don't want to be on autopilot. <laughs> you want it to be, uh, you want to set your autopilot. You don't want to have your autopilot kick in because you're watching Netflix or this is what you always do. And this kind of goes back to that question about how do you improve. One of the big things about improvement is to control your autopilot. Know when you are using your imagination and when you're saying, I don't have time or desire to change what I'm doing. I'm just going to do what I've always done. And that time comes. It comes for a lot of people. I mean, for some people, that lasts 30 years. You know what I mean? Uh, but for others, it's just either deadline-based or it's a phase or something like that where they say, you know, this is not the point in my career where I'm uh, reinventing the wheel. This is the point in my career where I'm perfecting the wheel. And that's, that's an important distinction. It's an important thing to know. Um, there's no right or wrong. It's, a, it's all your personal journey as far as that goes. But if you are trying to re if you're trying to uh, reinvent the wheel and you find that you're just you know kicking out the same old wheel you've been kicking out the whole time, what you want to highlight and look for is ha am I on autopilot? Am I doing some am I learning some things or trying to improve some things? But in this situation, I'm not actually thinking, I'm not actually using my imagination, which is my most powerful tool, I'm using habit, right? You don't want imagination to take the place of habit unintentionally. Sometimes it's useful, it's really useful on the deadline, right? But like, like right now, I have probably about 10 minutes to finish this piece, so I'm, I'm like, you know, uh, feats don't fail me now, let my habit take over. But in the case of, um, you know, coming up with the design, I let my imagination set the stage so that the, uh, the design of the piece would have a chance to hopefully have something that I think is pretty cool by the time it's over. So now that I'm only doing lines, well, I'm not as concerned about reinventing these lines and so on and so forth. All right, so we are almost done with this Hulk. And uh, Jason, if you are listening, can you please let me know if I have time to do some quick colors on this piece? Because if so, I uh, wouldn't mind wrapping it up with, with a quick color session. And it is, we're gonna be really simple. In fact, it takes it would take almost as long for you to answer that as it would be for me to draw it. So we're just going to go ahead and uh, wrap this up with some colors. And if they cut me off, they cut me off. All right, so same as before. So the thing is, I want to make sure I close all of these lines so I have a nice, easy selection. Hypothetically, 
you don't necessarily have to have all of these lines closed in your picture, right? Oh, you can be up plenty of time. You don't want to have these lines closed. You, I mean, you, you might not want to have those lines closed in your picture. You might want some open lines to indicate a light source or, or what have you. But since I'm my own colorist, I want to make flatting easy for me. So for me to make that flatting nice and easy, I'm going to make sure I close all of those exterior lines. All right, that's closed. I'm going to make sure I close all of those exterior lines Whoa. So that when I select it, I don't have to think, I don't have to worry about it. And the other thing we're going to do is I said this would be a little higher contrast. We have a little more shadows. And part of having a little more shadows is just casting a little harsher shadows on this face here. So we're just going to add a little bit of this business going on here, keeping this very loose, very free. And we're also going to quickly emphasize these eyebrows, give the old school a little bit of that old school kind of Jack Kirby business going on. And I also want a little bit more anger in that nose wrinkle. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's what I was looking for. All right. So now we are going to go into this piece and drop in some quick colors, refer other layers. Boom internal stuff, flip it, and I would go for, you know what, uh, I'm going to improvise here, I'm going to go Red Hulk, since we went with the Green Hulk before, all right. And we're gonna follow just basically the same rules that we did before. We're not doing a background color this time. Um, I don't know what color Red Hulk's pants are, but we're gonna do here, I'm gonna actually switch layers and I'm gonna close the lines as I need to, to make selecting easier. Because I wanna be able to just select his pants and, and everything else. So. So that is, so we're gonna actually select the pants here. Looking good. And that's select the whole thing. Let's try it again. There we go. Yeah, because that's, that's the only thing we have to select. So. The Red Hulk's pants, I'm, I'm going to hint at the purple, but we're not going to go full purple. Red and purple, they're more of like, they, they can work together. Any two colors can work together. But with red and purple, you definitely have to be careful how purple your purple is and how red your red is. So when you're mixing colors, desaturation is the key. If you look at any color wheel or color palette or anything like that, um, what you'll see is that in the middle of the color wheel is gray. So every color moves towards gray. So to get colors to work together more, you want to move them towards the gray. So to get purple and red to work together, you have to choose, do you want the purple or the red to move towards the gray? And in this situation, because I want the saturation on the Red Hulk, I'm going to move the pants towards the gray. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to select these pants and I'm just going to add in more purple via the shadows and the, um, and the gradient in just a little bit. We're not going to go nuts here. All right, so that's too light. Bam. Okay. So this is a little more purple. I'm just gonna pop those muscles out a little bit. And that's it, we're not going crazy. You know, just go purple into those shadows. Um, shadows, a lot of people desaturate their shadows. 
very often shadows have more color in them because the light washes out the main part of whatever it is like that's on the figure. So just keep that in mind when you're doing your shadows. Um, it's, it's your choice. It's like an artistic expression thing. But I like the feel of shadows that have a little bit more going on. Now I'm going to pop in a gradient layer and just bring a little of that. There we go. Just a little. So I like that there. We're going to kill the selection here and get that individually here. A little gradient fading from the background here. And there we go, simple colors on the pants, uh, nothing too crazy. And now we're going to go back to the body. And now we're selecting from the whole body. And with the red, we're just going to pop these reds out and have a little bit of quick fun as we bring this all to a close. I hope you guys have been enjoying this. I hope this was informative for you. Uh, let, the, let the good folks at Marvel uh, produce in this video series who do a great job. Thanks to those guys. And, and, and those, those men and ladies. When I say guys, I usually just mean everybody. But I know some people will feel excluded. Folks. <laughs> but yeah, the, the fine men and women behind the uh, production team of this are they're all great people. They make this very easy, very fun to do. So if you're enjoying it, let them you know let them know via the Marvel streams and everything that you're enjoying it. And, uh, and if you are enjoying my part in this, you can let me know on my Twitter, which I will flash on the screen as I bring the video to a close, which it will actually be in about, I'm going to say, we're going to be done in about another four minutes or so. So if you have any questions from this point on, you're going to have to find me personally on Twitter or catch the next stream when there's another artist on here because I am about done. So these shadows are pretty self-explanatory. If something's fading from the back, into the background, going away from the light, I'm going to shadow it more. Um, if something is casting over something else, I'm going to shadow it more. And that's pretty much it, you know. Um, I'm keeping this one very simple. Again, we're not doing fully painted marble stuff here. We're just doing um, a quick, quick colors, quick sketch Instagram style colors that will do the job of communicating which Hulk this is and what we're about in, in displaying this Hulk. Yeah, that's fun. That's fun. And so this is one of those things I just love. When you start coloring the skull, I mean, you know, and shading the skull and adding form to the skull, it can really add a lot of dimension to your piece. So we're going to do the same thing with the hair. We're just going to go super dark here. Not that dark. That's great. And the same rules as before, uh, I'm going to pop in these yellow eyes. Because there's no orange background, I can make them a little more orange than before, which I like as a compliment to the red. Yeah. And then the same thing with the teeth. I'm going to take that red, and I'm going to make the teeth a much, much, much lighter version of the red that looks white and gives the illusion of being white, but is indeed still has a lot of red on it if you were to actually go in and select the piece. And with this tongue, we're going to keep it super simple and just make it a darker, desaturated version. A little darker than that. There we go. Darker, desaturated version of the reds around him. In the last two ingredients, we're going to add, we're going to go back into that gradient layer. And same thing, we're just going to have a little soft gradient here. Give him a little bit of push. And now I'm going to go into the higher saturation, a little more orange, add a little bit lighter gradient from the top, throw in a little warmth. And for a kicker, to close this out, I'm going to add in, let's see, can we add in some highlights? All right, we're going to add in some highlights, but we're going to go a little, little orangey on the highlights. There we go.
a simple drawing in highlights, no big deal. Not going too crazy with it. All right, and that is going to do it for our, oh my God, I almost forgot to color his knee. I apologize. That's not going to do it at all. <laughs> but this is really easy because we're just gonna select from that color there and select a darker version of this color here and follow the same rules we were following. I'm just gonna construct a little bit of that knee, draw that in a little tighter. And for the leg, most of the legs would be in shadow as indicated by the ink drawing. And we're gonna do the same thing here. And then I'm just gonna go into the uh, pants, get that color. And close that out. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. We got a Red Hulk and a Green Hulk, uh, fully drawn, fully inked, with a little bit of tutorial involved as well. If you want to find me, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, and on those channels, I will also have a link to my YouTube, where if you have, again, I'm going to be doing a lot more art tutorials and stuff like that. So if you have questions and you, you want to hit me up for art advice, um, I'll be happy to help you guys out as far as questions go. And if you're looking for a portfolio review, I might not get to your portfolio review, but what I will do is I will make content and I will let you know when that content specifically addresses your portfolio. Uh, because I don't want to just help one person. I want to try to help as many people as possible. Because again, I'm a full-time artist with deadlines and everything else. So obviously, I just don't physically have the time to answer every question or review every single portfolio in that way. But thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys had a great time. I'll see you all in the next one. Peace.